Welcome to another episode of Candid Moments. Uh, my today's guest is a friend of mine who I met in Toastmasters years ago. He sometimes challenges me with the wisdom he imparts on me. But nonetheless, we always have soulful conversations. Please help me welcome Sean Gillis to the microphone. Hi, Sean. Hi, Candace. How are you? I'm I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Good. So how's your day going? Um, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's good um what are three things today that you're you are grateful for oh we're getting into the deep stuff right off the cuff eh? absolutely do you not uh, know me <laughs> uh so a pretty easy answer i suppose because uh i woke up this morning beside uh my beautiful girlfriend Chantel. And uh, we had a great conversation before we even got out of bed. So grateful for Chantel in my life. Uh, right beside Chantel in bed was my little dog, Billy, who always mm -hmm. brings me joy. She's a Boston Terrier and um, she's five years old. And yeah, I just love her to bits. So I'm really grateful for that. And uh, I'm making progress uh, professionally speaking. I won't go into too many details, but I'm uh i've got a few plates spinning right now uh, in a professional realm and so i'm grateful for the opportunities uh, in that regard and i'm excited about uh, the challenges that uh, lie ahead in terms of uh, accomplishing some of my goals so yeah beautiful i love it okay so it's my turn okay yeah tell me what you're grateful uh, this morning i'm grateful for talking to mom and having coffee with her over the phone that is our ritual every day i love that woman she's my soul sister shout out to mom whenever she uh watches this it's not uploaded yet but, uh, mom. second i had an an awesome workshop that I'm working on right now. And it was scheduled for tomorrow. But yesterday morning, I woke up and I wasn't feeling too hot. So this morning I woke up and it was full fledged. Like I have a cold. Oh, I'm, no. It's okay. I don't want to spread it. So we just rescheduled for March 9th. So I have more time to really craft this workshop. But I'm grateful that I'm able to reschedule that. So there's no harm, no foul, no loss there. And third, I can't say I quite learned the lesson, but I'm going through something personal that I'm very stubborn about and it's it's irking me, but I think I'm slowly <laughs> learning the lesson and it's, I'm just grateful that I'm still young, not young and stupid, but just, in, in, naive, the maybe? in the learning process pardon okay yeah. yeah yeah and i'm grateful for this interview hey right on well yeah actually that that kind of goes without saying i'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk with you today because uh yeah we go back a few years it's always a pleasure to talk with you you are such a light in this community that uh everybody like everybody who knows you uh knows that your energy and your your charisma is infectious. So uh, it's definitely a wonderful opportunity to speak. Uh, I enjoy it. You are so sweet. I actually, I did not reschedule our Zoom because I was thinking one of the best flawless speech evaluations that I gave in Toastmasters, I had, I was sick and I had lost my voice. And the general evaluator that night was Michelle. And she gave me, she told me that it was the best evaluation I had ever given. And that told me today, okay, you can still do your Zoom meeting, okay? Get your stuff together, lady, and just do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I gotta knuckle down. Absolutely. Yeah. Today, so the theme, what's brewing in your mind? I know there's a lot going on in your life right now, professionally, and there's been, there's some growth there. But the theme of surviving to thriving, where does that stem, John? Uh, well, oh man, there's so much to unpack with that question that uh, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. You were the one who chose it. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I, I was looking for something that was a little bit uh, uh, motivational or, or something that hopefully people can relate to, because I think that a lot of people uh, 
struggle with the, the uh, concept of thriving and oftentimes find themselves in a pattern of surviving, uh, just getting by rather than, um, rather than fully enjoying their successes and, and the luxuries of, of a good life. So um, off the top of my head, I suppose I came up with the, the idea of this theme in part because I myself have spent many, many years uh, essentially surviving. I have a bit of a personal history with uh, some mental health issues and that are you know, concerned with you know, depression and, and social anxiety to a certain degree. And um, that might come as a surprise to some people because uh, outwardly, I seem maybe uh, well-spoken and, and easy to get along with, but internally, I often have a struggle uh, uh, my internal critic well, it really does a good job of cutting me down to size on a fairly regular basis. So I've spent a lot of my life uh, surviving um, in a psychological capacity. However, I've also had some brushes with death or uh, near death experiences physically. Uh, that I managed to survive, luckily enough. Uh, I'm really grateful that uh, things turned out the way they did because um, if they hadn't, then we wouldn't be having this conversation here and now, so. Right, there's uh, the definition of gratitude right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, so when talking about your demons, Sean, because I think that's totally universal. Everybody has their demons that they deal with. Over the years, like you're still young and vibrant, but you still have so much to learn, right? Mm. Um, how do you how do you keep those demons at bay? Do you know how to tame your dragon? Uh, great question. So I don't even know if I can answer that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes uh, sometimes those inner demons can be a bit of a hydra, which is a, a mythological creature that if you cut off its head, seven more grow. And so, wow, good yeah. metaphor or Thank analogy. You. Thank you. Um, so it's it, coping with inner demons has been a struggle uh, throughout my my years on this planet. Uh, sometimes I've had better successes than others. I don't know if I have a hard and fast rule or uh, methodology to coping uh to be totally forthcoming and honest um i spent many years uh escaping my problems for lack of a better word with uh, substance abuse i smoked uh, marijuana on a frequent basis uh, and if marijuana wasn't available uh, i would consume alcohol to uh you know take the edge off so to speak and uh, that would work temporarily to alleviate some of the issues, uh, but it definitely, it was only a Band-Aid solution. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a proper healthy solution to actually dealing with, uh, you know, some of my struggles. Um, so I'm proud to say that I've uh, been on the wagon, uh, the proverbial wagon for the last, uh, Quite a while um, and so now to cope with those inner demons that still persist they, it's not you know i didn't just one day decide okay i'm going to stop uh with my substance abuse and then all my problems are going to disappear with it um the inner demons are still there but uh i keep them sort of on a leash by just monitoring myself and making sure that I'm aware of my energy levels, whether that has to do with, you know, the, the foods that I'm consuming, uh, the exercise that I may or may not be getting because that's a exercise can be a pleasure or it can be a chore. It depends on your attitude around it. Right. And if the dance studio is closed or not for the gym. <laughs> exactly. I know right. you're a big dancing. So, um, 
uh, or so for me, I, I enjoy walking the dogs to to get some fresh air and and stretch my legs. Um, but also, uh, rest is so tremendously important. I'm, I've noticed, especially recently, <laughs> how how vulnerable I become when I am tired. How vulnerable I am to my inner demons telling me that I'm inadequate, telling me that I'm, uh, you know, uh, not not well liked, or uh, what are some of the other things that I tell myself that are are, you know, maybe true for some people but not true for others. Uh, just not successful. Just you know, never going to achieve, et cetera, et cetera. That's, it goes, that's the list a goes lie. on. It well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because uh, I'm of the opinion that life is not always rainbows and roses, right? Sometimes no. it's storms and, and thorns. And, uh, and so there is pain in life. There is suffering in life. Uh, it's just a matter of fact, like it's indisputable. You know, there's death. There's uh, chaos, there's accidents. Ha accidents happen, uh, you know, for no good reason other than just uh, the factors all collide at the same time and and boom, things change. So right. uh, yeah, to sum up, to answer your question, I, I do my best now to, to check in if I'm feeling, to check in with myself if I'm feeling especially uh, exhausted and to, um, to, to look for more healthy coping strategies than, than substance abuse. Chantal has been a phenomenal help. My girlfriend has been like just an absolute rock in terms of uh, guiding me through the, uh, the healing process. And, and so I owe her such a debt of gratitude. That is so amazing. It's so important to have a good support system. Mm -hmm. I, like there's many people in my life, for example, who I've told them coming up will be, it will mark two years of my sobriety. Congratulations. And thank you. And that was a personal decision. I was going through something and it just, that didn't serve me. But as a result of anxiety, I am well medicated. I don't have panic attacks where I feel like I need to run out of the room or I feel like I'm falling as a result of vertigo or some sort of like just crazy chaos. Anyways, I don't have those episodes anymore, but the medication I'm taking, I was told by the doctor that if I were to mix, mix up with alcohol, it would cause sedation. And I'm a good sleeper, so I don't need that, but sedation to the point of death. So no, thank you. I don't need, so it wasn't difficult for me to stop drinking. But my point is that some of the people in my life will say, oh, well, good for you. But it doesn't mean that I have to stop drinking. No, I wasn't telling you to have. Um, it, it wasn't a reflection on you. I quit drinking for me and my life and my brain and my productivity. It has nothing to do with the amount of drinks you consume. You can drink all you want. I don't care. It's, you know, I'm living a sober life and that's what important to me yeah absolutely i mean i personally have been abstaining uh for my reasons other people consume for their reasons and right. it's none of my business what those reasons are no. if they want to share with me some of those reasons and ask for my opinion on those reasons then we can have a conversation but i think that um that, yeah, that that uh, sense of defensiveness is is just another demon. It's just another one of those heads on the hydra, uh, where people think that there's maybe a judgment uh, taking place um, on the on another person's part when that's not necessarily the case. Because I mean, mean, like one of their demons, like a reflection on them. Is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that. Could it could be that they they might feel like they're being judged because they're choosing to consume alcohol and you're not and so all, all of a sudden there's this perception that you might be better than them in some way shape or form right which, which is not the is, case 
not the case. You're you're living was, your according to your rules, right, and your right. your capacities, and they live their life according to theirs. It's as simple as that. Right, and I was a wacko when I drank. I was the <laughs> loudest person out. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> Just for an example, do you remember that time where we had a welcome, like a, what's it called? Like a housewarming party at your house. And we invited, you invited a whole bunch of Toastmasters. And uh, we had smoke pot that night and I was drinking whiskey. And you had to walk me home, which at the time was just down the street. But I was like, my brain doesn't understand. Um you know, like OLG, know your limit, play within it. I don't understand, my brain or my injured brain doesn't understand what moderation is. So I didn't, that didn't bring the best out of me. You're not, you're not alone in that, Sean. Uh, I almost called you Chantel, Candice. <laughs> you're not alone uh, in that regard in the sense that uh, alcohol and and, you know, Whatever it may be, for me it was for me it was mostly pot. I had my reasons to consume pot, but uh, it it turned into an abusive relationship in the sense that I uh, I struggled with uh, knowing how to like keep that habit categorized and relegated to you know certain times of the day or even better certain times of the week. You know, there were times, there's times in my past that I smoked pot when I really shouldn't have. Just, I'm just going to leave that there. Right. Uh, you oh. know, whether it was like, well, yeah, whether it was before a social uh, gathering, which is a terrible idea for, for me, for me, right? I want to make that perfectly clear because some people can smoke pot and they're the, they're the center of attention. They're the, they're the life of the party and that's fine by them. For right. me, I tend, to, I tend to become very introverted, very withdrawn, okay, and, uh, and very uh, like I tend to ruminate a lot, which you know is a, is not nobody likes a ruminating uh, fly on the wall at at parties, you know. No, I th I think I can relate to that in the sense that by ruminating so much when you're in that state, when you're inebriated so much so that it causes a bit of paranoia yes yeah that is was that not the most terrifying feeling it's certainly not the uh, party mode for sean no no, no and no, either <laughs> yeah. somebody i used to work with years ago uh shared an expression with me that i i keep in my back pocket and that is uh paranoia will destroy you which is, I find to be very true. Uh, if you allow yourself to be paranoid, then, I mean, what are you really afraid of? Uh, you're afraid of the unknown. And there's so much unknown out there that uh, it's possible that you're afraid of everything. When, when you're in a paranoid, when, sorry, I should say me, because when I'm in a paranoid state of mind, I'm essentially afraid of all sorts of, factors that I can't control and it's just you know that's as far as recreation goes <laughs> as that's far not... as like <laughs> therapy goes that's not really a productive use of time it's, or uh, nor healthy no not at all interesting yeah I have a question for you uh, okay so speaking of surviving and thriving can you uh, walk me through or uh, share with me a little bit of your mental state in the weeks and months after you came out of your coma after your after your car accident. Oh, uh, Sean. I know that's maybe a huge question to ask, but I am curious. But I think that it's an important thing because you survived a catastrophic accident that you know that's such a such a huge part of your life story but i'm just curious as to what kind of mental state you were in when you were in survival mode because you were in the hospital for months and i'm, I'm curious to know more about that 
did you read the book? I did. Okay. It was two years ago, unfortunately. But I, it's okay. It's okay. Um, somebody approached me yesterday. They want to make a movie. Uh, <laughs> but I think Maybe. it's a scam. I'm not going to go for it. The weeks. Fall what an excellent question, Mr. Gillis. The, okay. Last year of 2021, I celebrated 20 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Since my new life. Same name, um, 20 years goes by like that. Um, the weeks following. I was in such a brain fog and it wasn't, I thought it was drugs, like morphine. I thought I was sedated. I thought I had just woken up from surgery, mind you. I did wake up from surgery, but the brain injury, the rain, the metaphorical rain on my bonfire, read the book, um, caused so much mental fog, let alone waking up, not being able to see properly because my optic nerves were severed um, completely on this side. Nope, sorry, this side. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful for what I can see from my left eye. But when people came in and told me, oh, that was only later, but weeks, I remember waking up. I had my long-term memory. So I remembered that I'm Candace. I remember who my family was, my childhood memories. And I asked for mom and I woke up from the coma. And Oh, it was so hard. It was, uh, once they told me what had happened, I didn't believe it because I don't, I have retrograde amnesia. So everything, a month prior to losing consciousness, I do not recall. So the brain did not absorb that. But when they told me that this happened and AJ died, I thought, that can't be true. I don't remember that. Why are you telling me something I don't remember? And I was so lost. And when it came time to like rebuild myself, which in any scan there is in the medical field, you cannot find the self in the brain. But I had to re rebuild my new identity. So this is the new... Oh, uh, this is the new Candace. I, does that answer your question at all? Does that scratch the surface? Absolutely. Okay. Now, I'm just curious as to whether or not there were any specific moments where you had made a decision that you were going to survive, or if it was if it was more instinctual. There was a pivotal moment. I was in a wheelchair. And I couldn't undo the buckle on the, my wheelchair because I said, help me to undo my buckle because F this, I want to get up and walk. And they said, you can't walk. I'm not going to take off the buckle. And I said, F you, because listen, I'm going to get up and walk. I'm going back to school. I'm going to live a happy, fulfilled life. And nobody can tell me otherwise. And that's what's going to happen. Okay, get it, got it, good. And <laughs> I just kind of, went on after that, even though there were so many moments where I felt as though there was no hope, I would have to snap myself out of it and say, no, listen, you're going through this for a reason. It's a really good story. Something is shifting in life, but there's, look at the bigger picture. So I started to have like, um, I'm not going to say a coming to Jesus moment, but more of like, um, a spirituality moment like a spiritual moment thinking about purpose a spiritual awakening right and even mm -hmm. though i live with pain and it is uh, it's hard mm -hmm. so i'm grateful for this cold because it's making me not focus on my pain today so much 
is it's minus 25 today, it's the 15th of February. I'm in pain, but the cold is making me think of getting better and focusing on this workshop and creating content. So I go off topic, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I think, uh, I think I heard years ago that one of the keys to being happy and happiness is an arbitrary emotion. So uh, I don't want to delve too much into the concept of happiness, but apparently okay. uh, I, think this, I think this rings true. One of the keys to happiness is having something to look forward to. Yes. And yes. so if you were looking forward at that time when you were severely disabled and injured, uh, if you had made the decision to look forward to something as simple as just walking again, learning to walk again, right? Or, you know, just getting that seatbelt off the wheelchair. Right. Uh, if you remember, I know it's been a while since you read the book, but the first time I, I ran in physiotherapy while wearing that helmet, it was such a moment of freedom. But I, I was still so, um, I guess you can say injured. And I wasn't to the point of healing where I, my body, my tear ducts couldn't produce tears. I would have wanted to cry at that moment. But I only cried in September that year. So even though I was running for the first time, it was like, a, a, let's call it a coming to Jesus moment. like a, like an, oh my God, this just happened. This was, if I can do that, okay, I'm a, you know, and I'm a ballroom dancer and a Latin dancer, but I'm also a stroke survivor. So my dance teacher at Cambrian, Jan, I love her. She didn't know what my struggle was. So I limp on the dance floor. It's not a secret but I still dance pretty good for a white girl. And the people in the Dominican told me that. So I own that and it's part of my legacy. <laughs> I love it. But when she found out when the book came out, she was so in awe of it because, she, and I loved that I didn't have to tell her, Jan, like I have difficulty. No, I don't need for her to know that because she, did, she treated me like all the other students, except when it was time to show the girl steps, she would take me as an example to show the steps. And Walking. all of the sudden, like my whole life, I wanted to be teacher's pet. And then all of a sudden she uses me to be an example. Obviously I was doing something right. And I was, it just brought me so much joy. Excellent. Yeah. That's a great story. Thanks. Um, life is so full of... <laughs> Ah, oh, excuse me, trial, um, so much joy within the, those, those trial moments, like the, what's the word I'm looking for, John, come on. Um, so the trials and tribulations? Yeah, but there's another word for it. Like, it's not anguish, but it's like our suffering, I guess. Oh, yeah. We can yeah. thrive, and I've learned how to thrive too. I can't say there wasn't any. Yeah, it was hard, but this is Tom. This interview is not about me; it's about you. I think it's about us. We're having a conversation. Yeah, that's true. I want to. I want to learn from you. I mean, you are an, such an inspiring person in so many ways that it's uh, important. I think that people hear your story as we go as well. That's and, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. I, I don't like taking no for an answer. And I think it's really important to be that stubborn, especially when going after your goals and your dreams. That's why I'm so excited to give this vision board workshop. What's on your quote unquote vision board for this year or the next five years? I don't uh, have a vision board, first of all, so okay. I don't have anything on there. Um, but long-term wise, I'd like to become a professional speaker. I'd like to be a, a motivational speaker. 
uh, get in front of kids or adults uh, to help them better understand their roles and responsibilities in terms of um, their place in the community. I think sometimes, especially in this day and age where everything in the society seems to be so individualized, uh, there's, you know, uh, the computer scientists, uh, Google and Facebook and Instagram and all these sort of things, they all write programs that have algorithms in them that, that are designed to uh, pay attention to what kind of content you're interested in and then feed you more of that content that you're interested in. So it becomes like a self-reinforcing feedback loop when you go online and, and start to think that uh, whatever you are interested in, uh, probably everybody else is interested in. And I think that's a bit of a, a narcissistic uh, approach. Uh, right. as, or not, not necessarily narcissistic, I mean, but... But it's, it's. I think that it fosters. It can. It can foster a sense of narcissism, because we we are constantly consuming things that are that appeal to us, and uh, are not. We're not being made aware of uh, opposing, or you know, perhaps counter points of view. Where's um, the growth there? If there's no. Um... Like if it's this the same kind of not feedback but content that we seek, it doesn't allow room for growth. If it's the same monotonous thing, that's the definition of insanity, expecting a different result. Yeah, like exactly. Doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit of, it's a bit crazy making when yeah you go on YouTube and I mean anyway. That's okay. Okay, so as far as your speaking career, John. Sure. Um, if you don't have an answer, I might have an answer just to help you. But um, do you have a coach? Uh, not a specific one. I have one in mind that I've actually been considering approaching. Good. Uh, who uh, you are? You you're aware of her? She Lynn Raven Fahey. And okay. Maybe she be on your podcast one day. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm considering uh, getting in touch with Lynn to ask her about uh, possible coaching opportunities. Wonderful. Uh, but um, at the same time, I'm not going to say that I, you know, I don't need help because <laughs> I need help and right. lots of it. Who doesn't? Uh, <laughs> but I don't. I don't have like a particular person that I would say is my coach. I have a lot of, you know, I, there's a lot of people that come to mind that I would consider uh, informal mentors. Okay. I, uh, I may have someone in mind for you, but we can talk about that after the recording. Sure. Yeah. Just, yeah. it might help you. Yeah. If, if you can tap into my resources as a friend, right? It's beneficial for both of us, right? Because I would want to do the same with you if you had someone in mind, right? Yeah. That's what yeah. friendship is all about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cooperation and yeah. Uh, compassion and um, creativity. Yes. Yeah. It's exciting to be creative, I think. You know, it's a little nerve-wracking at the start, at the outset, when the you're staring at a blank canvas and you're not sure which color to use but once you get rolling uh sometimes in my experience i i have some fine art background i just saw some background in fine art i should say um okay in my experience i've noticed that uh sometimes paintings actually can take care of themselves but only if you're willing to actually put the brush strokes in like the painting will tell you that it's 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 an odd thing, but uh, in the creative process, it sort of unfolds. Whether whether it's uh, painting a picture or writing a paragraph or a book, uh, <laughs> you could probably speak more to the book writing process than I could because I don't have a book. 
uh, with my name on it. But uh, from what I understand, the creative process has to do with like there's the initial the initial phase, which is one of the most difficult phases. I mean, use the the analogy of uh, starting a car. Most uh, you know gas powered engines consume like a tremendous amount of energy, electrical and uh, uh, fuel wise, uh, in the initiation phase. And then, especially when you begin rolling, like the first 20 kilometers per hour, you're using like a tremendous amount of fuel to get the, to get the car rolling. And then once it's actually up to speed, you don't have to like keep the the pedal to the metal, so to speak, you can actually just hit it on, put it on cruise control and the car uses its momentum to, to propel itself forward. It's just uh, the way physics works. Or at least that's how I understand my limited understanding of physics. Uh, when you've got momentum, like it, it helps it, it. When you have momentum, you become more efficient. Right. But there's a there's a tremendous amount of energy expenditure in the initiation phase of of what have you, whether it's driving a car, painting a picture, uh, you know, starting a new job, mm -hmm. uh, uh, raising children. Like there's all mm -hmm. sorts of energy that gets devoted at the initiation phase, and then as things progress, it sort of falls into place nicely, and then. Interestingly enough, like the end or the uh, the yeah the end of the journey, so to speak, um, presents itself naturally. Sometimes the journey is five minutes long. Sometimes the journey is five years long. Sometimes the journey is fifty years long. Um, when it seems like five lifetimes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. When you were talking about the painting, were you used, were you speaking in metaphors? Uh, no, it was. Literal terms? Literal, yeah, like I've got a painting upstairs right now that uh, I'm ready to gift to a friend. I was asked to do a painting a few years ago for some friends um, for their living room. And uh, I was nervous about it at first, but I decided to just set aside my nervousness or my trepidation and you know uh i so i agreed that i would do a painting for them and i spent like probably about a month and a half on that painting it was pretty it was a pretty large painting it was abstract so that's always nice when it's abstract because you can make I it look like whatever you want you can make it look like whatever you want right i'd love to nobody see can tell paintings. you that it's, it's not a uh, it's not a painting if it's got if there's paint on a canvas it's a painting so right interesting um, so how do you do you paint with feeling sometimes sometimes i paint with music well, i mean music is a feeling so uh i enjoy yeah i enjoy the creative process or i enjoy painting with uh, with music on because i I find the two complement each other very, very nicely. There's a certain, there's a certain amount of flow uh, with music, and that helps me get into the type of creative headspace that I need in order to, um, in order to create the flow on the two-dimensional surface or on the canvas. Beautiful. So, is that more like leisure-based painting? Like, is it is it fun for you, or is it a therapy for you? Or both? I'd say both. Okay. Definitely both. Because uh, like years ago, I was living in Montreal and uh, I was going through a dark spell. Uh, you know, I won't go into details, but I wasn't, I wasn't in a good spot mentally, uh, feeling pretty depressed, pretty, pretty low on myself and where I was at. I was in a, I was in a loving relationship with a beautiful woman at the time. I mean, she's still a beautiful woman. We're still, we're still great friends. We, uh, when we broke up, we promised that we would remain friends, and uh, we've, we've kept our promise to each other. But I was in a dark space, and uh, somehow I just 
like it just clicked that I needed to get some paints and paint it out. And I have uh, the painting. I mean, I, I did several paintings in that, during that period, um, but I've only kept one and it's upstairs. And uh, it's funny because I showed some friends um, after it was completed, I showed them the painting. And my one friend who has a background in psychology, she actually like commented that she saw depression in the painting. Wow. And it's an, abstract, it's an abstract painting. I didn't just write, you know, I didn't just paint the word depression on the canvas. I just, I just painted what I felt. And uh, she hit the nail on the head. So I was like, kind of complimented, kind of a little bit embarrassed because, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to share these things, but. Right. And it's, it goes to show the level of healing that you were going through and how pain inspires beautiful art, whether it be a piece of music or a painting. Sure. I mean, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's two kinds of love songs, right? There's a uh, songs about finding love and there's songs about losing love. Those yeah. are, that's pretty much it. Most, most love songs are, it's, it's one or the other. Um, so you're either, yeah, you're either happy or sad. That's the, that's the dichotomy of life. That's the yin and yang. You're, I mean, it's not always as black and white as, as either happy or sad. Sometimes you can be both at the same time. But, uh, <laughs> You're not preaching to the choir, Sean, because I'm very hormonal this week. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, you can be in both both realms at the same time. And yeah. Yeah. Well, so Valentine's Day was yesterday. But like we're talking about love. So you're somebody in in a healthy relationship, very loving. And, and then there's me and I'm very, I'm single, but there's lots of love in my life, but I don't have like one main companion. And I'm okay with that, whatever. Well, okay. I don't have a whole yeah. face, that's absolute bullshit. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, uh... It's, it's always a challenge in whichever camp you're in, right? The grass is always greener, you know, uh, which is only half true, I think. The grass is green where you water it. Is a, is a, exactly. I love it. I love it. You know? And also, like, the, the grass being greener, it's a matter of perspective. I realized this with, uh, back when I was living in Montreal, around the time that I did that painting I was just describing. I was uh, standing on the balcony. It was uh, just a two-story, um, just a two-story uh, semi-detached uh, house, like an apartment. We were on the second floor of an apartment. Our apartment was on the second floor. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. Anyway, um, I was having a coffee on the back balcony, and I was looking at the grass, the the lawn in the backyard of our place, and it was like patchy. And, you know, like not a very healthy lawn because in large part because we had two large dogs at the time and they destroyed the lawn with like going to the bathroom on it and running around on it and all that sort of thing. And the neighbor's lawn uh, was like pristine. It almost looked like a golf course. It was like a beautiful green, lush. He also had a dog, but like he, he manicured his lawn regularly. But it occurred to me that if I were standing on his balcony, looking at his lawn, I would see the details. I would see the, the, the spots that were like the patchy spots um, in his lawn. And if I were to look over at my lawn, I mean, they're, they're, there was a pretty obvious difference between the two. But the point I'm trying to make in regards to the perspective of the grass being greener has to do with the fact that if you're looking straight down, imagine if you're looking straight down at a, a bunch of blades of grass, okay? 
you'll be able to see the spaces in between all the blades of grass and you'll see the dirt. And so it looks like it looks green and brown. But if you change your perspective, if you change your vantage point, if you change the, the, the point of view, so you're looking, instead of, instead of looking down at the lawn, you're looking across at it, then the blades of grass are actually going to be uh, overlapping. Sort of standing, overlapping each other. And therefore they're gonna look, it's going to look greener. So literally the grass is greener. The grass looks greener on the other side of the fence because of where you're standing on the, on, in that particular spot. But yeah. if you approach it, you'd get, you'd get the details that there are defects there are defects wherever you look, but there's also beauty wherever you look. And we can relate that to what, Sean? Different stages that we are in life. Absolutely. Right? Different yeah. Well, the dog just came home, so I'll just dog up for a quick walk. It might, it might get noisy, but we'll see. Okay. That's profound, though. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that was one of those like aha moments where I was like, oh my goodness, it's just a matter of perspective. That's, that's all it is. So change your perspective and you can change your life. Right. Hey, there's a book in you right there, Sean. <laughs> right. So I have a question for you because you, you asked about, uh, who I would consider to be a coach. I'm curious about some of the lessons that you learned from your, um, as, again, <laughs> going back to soon after your accident you shared with me in the past um the psychologist that you worked with i'm not sure his name off the top of my head but dr matheson dr matheson thank you um yeah if you would wouldn't mind indulging me with a, a story or two about how he helped you shape your perspective after your accident because i understand you were very angry with the person who caused the injuries and right. and caused the death of your of your boyfriend um so understandably so but i mean yeah just walk me through some of that uh some of those um, lessons you're gonna have to re uh watch the episode i did with wayne um it was, it's about a, a maybe 10 episodes ago or so maybe more because okay. this friday is 50 so if you go back on my website you can see them can see the episode with Wayne, but we talk about the brain more in that episode. So are you asking me about, oh, no, I'm wrong. You're asking me about the forgiveness part. That uh, well, that, that's a huge one for sure. Um, that was another psychologist, but still part of the same healing process. Yeah, if you want to start there, I mean, forgiveness is a, is a is a big f word for sure mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite f words ah <laughs> uh, wow life-changing for me sean talking about art and having my feelings on paper when that psychologist, it wasn't Wayne, it was another one, Dr. Clausen, still, again, um, a brain injury rehab psychologist. He asked me to draw my feelings. And I was like, are you sure about this? Because um, it's going to be dark. Yeah. I drew with a black marker pen a really dark, dark cloud. And it was so full of really angry, yucky, gross emotions. There was a lot of chaos there. Yeah. He asked me, and I was so dead against opening up my heart to anything. He asked me what it would feel like if I was happy. And I really had to like sit with myself and think about what that felt like because I knew what it like it felt like to blame my problems on somebody else 
I, I did, it was quite the journey. I'm, I gave a speech in Toastmasters about it. So when I decided that this situation was bigger than just me, <coughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> what it would feel like <clears throat> to forgive. <clears throat> let's just pretend for a moment, Candace, that you forgave. And I was like, okay, that's that's not cool because it's it will never happen. Okay, so whatever. Okay, let's just pretend what that would be like. So I sat with this moment, this feeling of like being free and, and happy. And it was I was just able to live my life. And I I, I spent a lot of time, months and months and hours and hours and hours of just trying to figure out my feelings. And when I met that man who took my vision away and who rained on my bonfire, I have the scars to prove it, he told me, all the details, Sean, of that night from his perspective. So now I'm seeing the story, my story, from somebody else's vantage point. So when he told me everything that happened and he looked at me and said that that wasn't meant to happen. I didn't mean for that to happen. He was still an ass for not planning his ride home. But at the end of the conversation, like it was so soulful and, and deep. And all of a sudden it was bigger than us. And I told him I suffered. He was the enemy and I swore. At the end of the conversation, all that baggage that in my backpack that I was carrying around that caused me back pain, I put the bag down that wasn't no longer mine. And I looked at him and I said, This, I can honestly say right now that I feel forgiveness and that's that is when that bag came off so I unclaimed that baggage of resentment and anger and it was gone I went to shake his hand out of respect for him in that moment and oh. he didn't want to shake my hand and I I felt for a moment I felt like he was dismissing me, but he didn't want to shake my hand. He pulled me in to hug me, like for a long, long time. And we both cried and, uh, whew, you're bringing me back, Mr. Gillis. <laughs> and then that, okay, so you read the book, right, Sean? Do you remember that the, the girl named Angel, who told me about her her aunt that had lost those two boys I'm a drunk driver so when I got out of the school I took my cell phone and I called Angel and I told her what I just did and I said you honey I said baby you inspired me to do this and I'm crying on the phone and then she's crying and she said that um she was so happy to be part of this journey. And a couple months ago, I was able to connect with her. And I sold her a book, <laughs> um, a soft cover, but- You're not gonna give them away. <laughs> no, and I wrote the best message in there. Oh, I hope you read it. I know she's busy with her children and her job and her husband. Yeah. That woman, who encouraged me to meet that man 
and feel forgiveness in my heart. He changed my life. That day, it was either a Tuesday or a Wednesday or Thursday, somewhere in there. I wished whoever, the first human I saw that day, I wished them happy whatever day it was. And then all of a sudden, my, my brain shifted. Remember we were talking earlier about shifting the mind, the perspective? So then every day, I made happy posts on social media about happy, whatever. What's today? It's Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. That, that saying, love life because life loves me. You want to see the painting? Sure. See it right there? Yeah, love, love life because life loves you. Yeah. My mom made that for me for Christmas a few years ago. Nice. She signed it. My, my name is up bottom. So my life, like, that's part of my legacy because of that moment. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Definitely started to. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. What was the, I mean, what that's was the a question? Huge, uh, how, uh, sorry, the, the original question was who helped you uh, and how in terms of uh, changing your mentality from basically one of being a victim to one of being a victor, I suppose. Um, so yeah, and I think I think that yeah, you definitely answered the question because forgiveness is uh, such a powerful emotion. It's such a difficult one to uh, wrap your head around. You know, depending on the severity of the uh, transgression and your you know your experience, that was a that was a not a hurdle. That was a mountain to overcome. So to be able to yeah, make the conscious choice to even just to meet the, the person that harmed you and you know killed your friend, your boyfriend, the bravery associated with that decision is just astounding. So good job for, for Thank you. Uh, oh, that was hard. But I think that like it's not just about me, Sean. Like you you're brave in your life because your own mountains on perspective so your mountains have a different terrain than my mountains and the way we choose to climb it i love speaking in metaphors uh, <laughs> is different so we're all a warrior in our own journey but it's how we right yeah it's I, all how we, I agree. It's some, but it's, it's unfortunately some people don't see it that way. Some people think that uh, that they're at war and that they're being attacked. I mean, I've been there. <laughs> you know, I have been there with friends and family coming at me from all sides, putting me in my place, making me defend myself, or they didn't make me defend myself. I chose to defend myself. Uh, so how do you get through that? What are the tools that you use to, to climb that mountain? Just taking it one step at a time. That's all you can do. And make sure that you're well equipped for the journey by again, being self-aware as to where you are on the slope. If you are moving up or if you're sliding down um but also you know you're, going back what's that you're you're making me want to reevaluate my situation in life right now oh, really is that yes. a good thing or a bad thing eye-opening okay okay yeah uh, but it's good so, yeah one step at a time is how i approach it because like i have an i have a, a quick story uh I was living out west in Alberta, Canmore, Alberta, and uh, I had been there. There's a there's a mountain there. It's called Ha Ling Peak. It's named after a gentleman who, back in the 1800s, he was a miner, and he was in town, and the, he made a bet with some people at the at the local bar that uh, he would be able to climb to the top of the mountain and back in a single day. And this was before they had any roads going up to that mountain. 
or anything like that. It was, it was a like a pretty big boast for him to to say that he was going to do that, but he did it. And so they uh, named the mountain after him. At first, it was um, it was named uh, incorrectly. It was called Chinaman's Peak, but in recent years, in the last uh, fifteen or twenty years or so, they they renamed the mountain Ha Ling Peak after Mr. Ling. Anyway, um, it's kind of an easy mountain to climb in the sense that, I mean, well, it's difficult to climb because there's the one face uh, of the mountain is like, it's a sheer cliff. It's like probably, I don't know, a few thousand feet of like just a cliff, but there's the back of the mountain, which is how Mr. Ling climbed it is a slope so that you're actually able to as ascend to the peak. And now there's a logging road that goes up behind the mountain. There's a lake back there. And so there's, there's a trail that uh, stems off of the road and goes up to the peak of the mountain. So one day, um, like I was getting ready to move from Canmore to Montreal. I'd been living in Canmore for almost two years and I had never made the trip up that mountain. So I decided to, uh, to go and I, I started the journey on bicycle and I biked, it took me about two hours to bike uphill all the way to the uh, trailhead. And the plan, because I didn't have any food or water with me and nobody knew that I was doing this, the plan was just to go to the trailhead and then turn around and ride the bike downhill all the way back to my apartment, to my girlfriend. The same girlfriend that I was telling you about, uh, Isabel, she, she and I moved to Montreal together. Anyway, so the plan was just to go to the trailhead and then turn around and come back. But once I got to the trailhead, for some strange reason, I decided to get off the bike and walk or hike, hike up the mountain to the top. And uh, that was incredibly difficult because I was, to be honest, I was a little bit hungover. We had been out with friends the night before and uh, I didn't have any food or water with me, but I just like just stubbornly decided that I'm doing this today because I'm probably not gonna have another opportunity before we leave in a week. So I started climbing the mountain, one foot in front of the other, just putting one foot in front of the other. And I made my way up and like, it got to the point where I actually, I was like gasping for air so bad that I almost, like I, I made the comparison that this must be what like Everest climbers feel like. Okay because it was like, I would take two steps and then have to take a two minute break. I would take two steps, have to take a two minute break. So anyway, I managed to make it to the top of the mountain and I saw Canmore down below. I saw the same view that Mr. Ling would have seen a hundred years earlier. And it was a beautiful view. I loved being up there by myself, but it occurred to me that you can't live on mountaintops. You can't stay there for very long because either bad weather will come in right. and uh, there's just there's just no resources or shelter on a mountaintop or this it's rare. So after I had rested for about 20 minutes or a half hour, I collected my energy and started the descent. And the interesting thing was that I was so exhausted, like my muscles were so sore and tired that it was actually almost more dangerous for me to be walking down the mountain than it was for me to be walking up it. <laughs> so as I was descending the mountain, I had to be very aware of my, of every step that I was taking because I didn't want to slip and break my ankle or, or what have you. And then I'd be stuck there because nobody knew that I was there. By yourself. So, yeah. So I was watching every step, just like pacing myself and being extremely careful. And uh, I, I, I just put it in my mind. I was like, just make it to the bike. Just get to the bike. If you can get to the bike, you're going to survive because you can just ride downhill from there. Like you just have to get to the bike. 
And so that was the only thing I was concentrating on was just one step at a time to get to the bike. I made it to the bike and then I coasted downhill all the way to uh, into town and biked my way back to the apartment. And Isabel was there and she uh, she opened the door because at this point it had been about five hours since I had left her in the morning. I took, I'd left her, you know, with the intention of just going for a bike ride around the neighborhood. But I had changed my mind and I, like a dummy, I didn't tell her where I was going or what I was doing. So she was worried sick for, you know, four and a half hours, probably five hours. Um, Sent the I, out to get you. <laughs> pardon me? That sent the troops out to find you? Well, she probably, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this was before cell phones and whatnot, so I don't know. Oh, so you didn't the, take a picture from the top of the mountain? No, I have to go back and take a picture next time I'm in Canmore. Hey, something to look forward to. There you go. Anyway, to, to wrap up the story, I opened up the door, or, or Isabel opened up the door to the apartment. And um, she said, where were you? I said, I just biked to the bottom of Haling Peak. And then I climbed to the top. And then I basically collapsed in her arms. And she like took me to the couch and put a blanket on me. Cause I was like, I went into a state of shock. Like I was, I was so depleted that like I was shaking and like I was dehydrated and sh like just wrecked. I was wrecked. <laughs> so she she ended up uh, lovingly uh, nursed me back to health and um and I survived. I survived the story. Wow. What did that teach you? Uh, <laughs> don't be an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Good one. Just, yeah. Like there's there's mountains to climb, but like you got to do it appropriately. You got to you got to have uh, a plan. Have a plan to get up that mountain and back down. That's the that's the real takeaway. Is that climbing to the top of the mountain is only half the battle. Climbing back down safely uh, is is uh, a consideration that needs to be made because you you know you can't live. On, you can't live on on a high and uh, or live on your successes. Like once you achieve something, you have to be willing to say, "Okay, I've been here. I've done that. Now it's time to move on and, uh, can and, we, and proceed." Can we equate that to or compare it to? our mental health journey. Sure. Sure. It's uh, it's easy for people to sometimes think that once they've achieved, you know, a certain level of financial success, you know, uh, maybe a particular relationship has, has uh, fallen into place. Uh, maybe there's a like a health goal, like a certain body weight that somebody wants to achieve. Then once you hit that, all your problems are going to be solved. Well, that's unfortunately not true. Right. Once you show, once you arrive to your destination, you still have the choice to make as to whether or not you're just going to like stop or you're going to basically pick up uh, the work and put in the sacrifice that needs to be made in order for you to, uh, to climb the next mountain. You can't be on more than one. You can't usually you can't be on one mountaintop at uh, a time. So beautiful. I love that, and I think that's a a great segue into our ending because we both have mountains to climb. Continue climbing different levels of our mountain, and that is our time for today. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Candace. I really, really enjoyed speaking with you today, as always. Me too. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for having a candid moment with me today and opening up, bearing your heart and soul to me. It was um, feels like therapy. These 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 candid moments. Good. I'm glad that you're getting something from it. I know that your audience does too. So 
uh, thank you for doing this. And uh, I look forward to uh, the next time we can speak in person over coffee or, yeah. or what have you. But um, yeah, thank you for doing this. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Sean. Give my love to Chantal. Um, I will. And have a beautiful day, Sean Gillis, everybody.